September 2010, a superior court strikes down three laws related to prostitution. Prostitution itself is technically legal in Canada, but it's been restricted by laws targeting solicitation, body houses, and pimping. Justice Susan Himmel removed those laws in Ontario. She said they make sex work more dangerous. With that ruling, Ontario set a precedent. It was subject to appeal, but in the meantime, the province was left with a legal void, and the whole country left with uncertainty about what would happen next. We advise you that today's program deals with mature subject matter that may not be suitable for younger viewers. I'm here with Joanne McGarry from the Catholic Civil Rights League and you represented the League as an intervener in the court challenge which as we know ultimately struck down three laws related to prostitution and what was your message for your group to Justice Susan Himmel? Well we, we think it's important that our laws reflect the shared morality of Canadians especially on this topic mm -hmm. which is all about morality and the dignity of women and uh, the safety of those that are in the sex trade and, um, um, and their communities. So um, we don't think this decision serves any of those interests. Now, Joanne, uh, you speak about morality and the interveners who were there, the Catholic Civil Rights League, the Christian Legal Fellowship, so uh, two religious groups, as well as uh, an organization called the Real Women of Canada. Mm -hmm. Now, critics would say that these groups are more interested in imposing Christian morality than the safety of the prostitutes. How would you respond to that? Well, we think the two go hand in hand. Um, the, the very essence of Christian morality is that you do not exploit people. Hmm. Because of this decision, pimping is, uh, could become legal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not something anyone wants to see. That's, that is not the moral position. And what are some of the, the consequences of that for, for society at large? I mean, why don't people want to have this next door to them? Well, I think we understand innately that this is all about the exploitation of women, um, the degradation of our sexual nature. I think everyone understands that. Um, there is no doubt that there's always been some disagreement about the best way to regulate prostitution. I think it's recognized that a certain amount of it is always going to be with us. Mm -hmm. And so that all we can really do through our laws and through their enforcement is regulate the more public aspects of it, uh, those aspects that that tend to draw in or interfere with those who are not involved and simply, uh, them, like, so this comes to mind in the whole area of solicitation. Mm -hmm. That's very much an in-your-face activity of people who don't want to, to have anything to do with it. So um, these are the aspects that we have traditionally addressed through the laws. And there was reason for it because those laws tend to reflect our views on the dignity of women, um, the sanctity of marriage and family life, the values of that kind. Now, when courts struck down the abortion laws, uh, there became a, a large legal void and, and suddenly an absence of restrictions on abortions. What do you think could happen if, if the government doesn't propose laws that can survive constitutional challenges? Yeah. Um, it's certainly interesting to speculate. I mean, as you know, the reality is Parliament was free, uh, remains free to this day to introduce an abortion law they could. should it choose mm -hmm. to do so. Um, the same would be true in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, Parliament is still free to address it. Um, but in the absence um, of a new law, um, if, if this decision were to stand, um, yeah, pimping is legal, living off and uh, keeping a common body house is legal. Uh, so too is solicitation, but every, everyone seems to agree that quite, quite a few of those laws were not well enforced anyway. Now, what do you see as the solution? Because it's been estimated that 300 sex workers have been killed in the last 25 years. And, and yet we know that prostitution is still highly visible in many of our cities. Would you agree that, that the status quo isn't working? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, I do think that. Um, the reality is this is dangerous work. Okay. If, you're, mm -hmm. if you're working as a prostitute, you're, you're always at risk for that, you know, that one type of client that's there to do harm. Um, I don't know how much the law can really address that, but um, the best thing, far better, is to just reduce the number of people who are involved in the life 
and our laws at least offered us some avenue for extending help to those who did wish to leave the life. And what are some ways that, that Canadians, um, ordinary Canadians, uh, can help reduce the prevalence of prostitution and, and help provide opportunities for people to, to find a way out? Because many Canadians feel really powerless when they see this in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, well, part of that's a much broader question than, you know, of things that the law can't really touch. I mean, mm -hmm. by the time someone is in the life, an awful lot's already gone wrong in her life. Mm. And um, if it's to do with, um, you know, with proper family life, uh, most of them have suffered sexual abuse, for example, um, drug addiction. Uh, these are things that um, are very difficult to address in isolation. I think you would find that a, that a healthy economy is of some value and that um, it, it affords more opportunities for, um, for um, a family to live reasonably well, for uh, more options for women to make a living. Now, if, certainly if you compared our time with the, um, what went on in big cities in Victorian times, you'd probably find there's less prostitution today. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think you could overlook the role of economic improvement mm -hmm. in that happening. But um, for those who are in, in the life and who would wish to leave, I mean, I'm, there are many street ministries that try to address that as best they can. Um, but generally speaking, I think once someone is already involved, it's much more difficult. It would be m much better if we could prevent it from ever starting in the first place. Well, thank you very much for sharing your perspective with us today, Joanne. Oh, thank you. One approach to reducing prostitution is helping those who are most at risk at being lured into the sex trade, and those are youth living on the streets. We visited two organizations which have the aim of helping those people on a previous Catholic focus. Let's take another look. Surprisingly, um, people talk about prostitution as um, 18 and older. But prostitution in terms of um, working sex trade on the street, they usually start, I think the estimate is around um, 16 for boys or 15 for boys, 16 for girls, but they do start younger than that. In movies and TV, prostitution is often portrayed as a simple transaction between consenting adults. Youth shelters like Covenant House see a different reality. Cardinal Gerald Emmett Carter founded the shelter in 1982 after seeing street youth sleeping outside his downtown office. Today, Covenant House provides a sanctuary to any homeless person under 24 years old. They're not making a conscious, informed decision. This is what I'm going to do for my life and I can handle and deal with all of the repercussions that may come from it. They're not even old enough in their thinking to comprehend what those repercussions may be. Another organization called Street Outreach Services works solely with youth involved in or at risk of involvement in prostitution. Its director maintains that no teenager dreams of becoming a sex worker. Do I think kids intentionally come downtown to become prostitutes? No. Um, in over 30 years, I've only met two or three young people who said, you know, I wanted to be a prostitute. For most, it's a, it's a process of eliminating anything else that's available to them. In 2006, SOS was in contact with over 1,000 youth involved in prostitution. Only a third had surpassed a grade 9 education. Half say they were sexually abused before they started living on the streets. Most reported mental health issues, and half of their clientele are male. If young people hit the streets of Toronto and are on the streets for more than, say, six to eight weeks, they're on the streets for two to six years. It, it becomes a vicious circle. When reality sets in for these men and women, SOS and Covenant House are ready to provide counseling. Each facility contains a medical clinic. Both work with local businesses to find jobs. They also deploy street patrols where they can inform street youth of the help available to them. We give them some choices about what it is they're going to work on. And young people particularly are much more engaged with the process when they feel they've had some choice. The choices could be um, going to school, going to work, getting job training, all of these things. No one sits around, though we expect them to do something, but we'll go miles with them. At Covenant House, social workers sit down with these men and women to develop an individualized plan. In-house schooling helps them complete their high school education. The youth are welcome to live here, so long as they're pursuing their plan. We want to teach them our values, which are values that leave the street values long behind. 
So we're teaching them, you know, you don't steal, you don't lie, you don't do any of these things that you had to do for survival on the street. That's not what you do here. These organizations warn against legalizing prostitution, as has occurred in Germany, the Netherlands, and parts of Australia. Proponents of legalization say it can make sex work safer by allowing regulation, but according to some studies where it has been legalized, the opposite has occurred. I can tell you stories about Holland, I can tell you stories about Australia, and I can tell you about people who are being abused in all those countries where prostitution is legal, because then there becomes a subset who are abused in the same business. And in Sweden, in fact, they've changed their law to, um, to make it now that it is illegal to buy, not necessarily to sell. And that's the big difference. If, you know, if there is a crime being committed there, then I would think it probably is the customers who are exploiting children, somebody's son, somebody's daughter, somebody's sister. Cardinal Carter once called opening Covenant House his proudest achievement. But despite the ongoing need, both Covenant House and SOS are limited by their funding. Do we get enough money to work with this population? Absolutely not. Is there more that we could be doing? Yes. We are 80% funded by donors for a $17 million yearly budget. Um, from that, we get a large portion from Share Life. We get a very small amount from government sources. It's not a lost cause, that's absolutely for sure. If one thing kids need to know, that they are not a lost cause. And we do have kids who, who have graduated from university to people who have worked in the community and have their own families and they tell us, it changed my life to be here at that time. I was, you know, this close to suicide and then I came to Covenant House and everything changed for me. In 2007, Robert Picton was convicted on six counts of second-degree murder. He's charged with 20 more. His victims disappeared from Vancouver's downtown east side, where many paid for their addictions with sex work. The case changed how the Canadian public saw prostitutes, from public nuisances now to victims. It may surprise you to learn that this is how the Toronto Police Force approaches the problem too through their sex crimes unit. Well, prior to coming into this unit and getting a full understanding of the, of the gravity of the problem, I didn't think, I, like most of society, didn't think it was a big problem. There was the odd street corner here and there, the odd um, part of the city that would, that would have these girls. But as I mentioned, it represents maybe only 10% of the entire problem. Um, what becomes a little more troublesome is when it, be when it goes indoor, it's not as easy as driving by, it's not as easy as looking out a window. Um, you have to go into each and every one of these establishments uh, to get a sense of, of what's going on in there. Our unit is different from a lot of other units in that our operational philosophy is to see the, the girls and, and boys that are out there, the prostitutes or sex workers, as victims first or even victims, period. So uh, recognizing that the girl is a victim first um, is, the, is the prime, again, philosophy of the unit. And as such, when we speak with them and we're, when we're developing the rapport, introducing ourselves to who we are, one of the things that we do say is you, that they're not gonna be investigated for prostitution. We recognize that a lot of criminal offenses occur specifically against them and target them such a small percentage of it is actually on the street. Most of society doesn't think it's a problem. They don't see the massage parlors, the body rubs, the strip joints, or even the escort agencies. They don't necessarily recognize them as prostitution. And the exact same thing is happening in each of those places that is happening on the streets. It's just in a different context and it's a different locale. A lot of other um, societies or even countries have um, decriminalized it to a degree um, and regulated. The problems with those types of places comes when you have someone who can't meet those health requirements or who can't meet those zoning requirements um, and then where are they going to go because they're not going to stop just because they don't meet the requirements and where they inevitably wind up is just on the outskirts of the legitimate uh, red light district. So it doesn't make the problem go away 
it just legitimizes a portion of it and the the disenfranchised part that doesn't uh, that can't work within that structure just operates on the outskirts so it'll always it'll always be there I can think of one case in particular a girl I met about uh, I was referred to about maybe two and a half three years ago um, she was 14 at the time from a troubled home I've uh, kept tabs on her since her criminal case where she was the victim. It's unfortunate, but she has uh, gone on a downward spiral since then. In this city, once the girl turns 16, they know um, that the social agencies that govern, that can govern a lot of things they do, that they have a less, less of a grip on them. I see her periodically. I have some contacts on the street that uh, give me some updates on how she's doing. Um, it's a less than optimistic situation, but you keep, you keep track of her, you keep tabs on her, and you hope for the best, and you, you offer whatever support you can along the way. Slavery was legal in the British Empire until 1833. While many tolerated it, a man named William Wilberforce would not. Motivated by his Christian faith, he led the campaign to abolish it. Today, Christian clergy, religious, and lay people stand at the forefront of a new campaign to stop the modern slavery of prostitution and human trafficking. I'm Father Sheikh Cullen. I'm from Ireland originally, and I was uh, sent to the Philippines as a member of the Missionary Society of St. Columban. And I was assigned to uh, the town of Alongapo City, which happens to be situated on Subic Bay and uh, in those days, 1969, uh, that was the time of the Vietnam War. Then uh, we discovered that uh, many of the street children were victims of sexual abuse and were being prostituted to the U.S. Navy, the military. So today we have a center for the rescue and recovery of children from prostitution. Uh, we had a very good campaign. We we're very happy that it led to a big political decision to you know, to phase out the uh, military bases. So they closed in 1992. And that was a huge change and the, the, the sex industry then completely collapsed. It's only later, many more from other countries came and started up the business again. With the growth of the internet and the lack of control, you know, I mean, the internet is one of the main driving forces of child prostitution and the sexual abuse of women and children. Right now we have uh, challenges of course come from the sex mafia who run the, in the, in the industry when we're trying to rescue children from abuse, when we're trying to bring perpetrators to justice, close down the bars and clubs. Uh, that's where we have great difficulties. You have the sex mafia giving us threats and death threats and uh, a lot of political resistance, you know, because many of the politicians they are really responsible for this uh, sex industry growing as it is by giving permits and the licenses for these establishments which are really fronts for prostitution. If people's bodies are being commodified, it follows that they will be traded and exported. Human trafficking entraps the most vulnerable and forces them into cheap, sometimes dangerous labor. This modern form of slavery often entails prostitution. The journey of a trafficked person might start in a country like the Philippines and end up right here in Canada. Statistics around numbers of trafficked persons globally vary from 700,000 to 400 million people per year. Um, there's a really wide discrepancy in, the, in those estimates which points to the problem um, of trafficking being such a hidden reality. The RCMP have actually done a study and they've produced estimates that say there are 600 to 800 people trafficked into Canada each year and up to 1,600 people trafficked through Canada to the United States. In Canada, even those who are trafficked for purposes of sexual exploitation, it's very hidden. So. That is certainly something that, that prevents the rescue because we don't know where these people are. We have approached this uh, with educational efforts and also advocacy efforts. 
We've been involved also with visiting politicians. As well, we produced a kit uh, when the 2005 election uh, happened. We produced a lobby kit to help people understand the issue of human trafficking in the Canadian context. In 2010, the Winter Olympics came to Vancouver. As with past global sporting events, with it came the likelihood of an increase in human trafficking. The Canadian Religious Conference developed a kit to raise awareness in high schools. It included a DVD of a series of monologues performed by drama students from St. Mary's Academy in Winnipeg. I used to work as a maid in a hotel back in Rio. I worked there for a couple of years until I was 19. and then. I met Claudia. Claudia was a guest at the hotel from Spain. One day when I was cleaning her room, she began to talk to me when she realized I understood Spanish. She told me that a fine young woman like myself could get a good job in Spain as a nanny. A part of me jumped at the experience to go to Spain, but the other part was reluctant to leave my father, my family. When I told my father, he smiled and said I should go, that I only deserved the best and that I shouldn't worry about him. With his blessing, I decided I would leave. When I arrived at the airport in Balbao, Spain, two large men came to meet me. They took me not to the nice house of the wealthy family I expected, but to a small apartment downtown. It was filled with other young women like myself. They all looked so sad and defeated. At that moment, my entire world plummeted. I felt a greater fear than I've ever felt before. I wasn't stupid. I knew what they wanted me to do. Silence is a form of consent. And if people are out there and they think that we should shut up and not uh, speak out against such evils, well, I think they're approving that kind of evil. To exploit someone at that level is to take their life from them. And I think that we, as a collective humanity, are really diminished, um, all of us. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that prostitution does injury to the dignity of the human person who engages in it, reducing the person to an instrument of sexual pleasure. It adds that the one who pays sins gravely. It is a social scourge. But how do we stop it here in Canada and abroad? We've touched on some of the legislative approaches, but these are only part of the solution. Change begins by giving men and women alternatives and sharing the church's vision of human dignity, a dignity that many try but can never take away from the women, men, and children who are victims of prostitution. We value your comments at Salt and Light, especially when we address sensitive topics like this one. Please email us at focus at saltandlighttv.org. For Catholic Focus, I'm Chris Dimitrenko. Mm -hmm.